Welcome to Life with David. I'm David, and today I'm continuing my research into the programmable input-output features of the RP2040. Last time, I increased the frequency range of an arbitrary waveform generator by incorporating a high-speed op-amp and revising the software. However, I noticed some frequency jitter that would probably make the AWG unusable for real-world testing applications. At the time, I figured I was done with this AWG experiment. However, while we were sitting down the Danube, I had an idea how I might minimize frequency jitter, at least for sine waves. So, why don't you join me as I try to make the AWG nice and smooth? In my previous AWG video, I replaced the slow, general purpose op amp with a high speed version and rewrote the software to increase the frequency of the waveform by decreasing the waveform sample resolution. I'll put a link to that video in the description below. Let's review the theory behind the arbitrary wave generator. A contiguous set of memory locations is filled with values representing a waveform, which we'll call a wavetable. That information is repeatedly output using direct memory access to the programmable input-output. The PIO, which runs at the state machine clock frequency, outputs 8-bit parallel information to a digital-to-analog converter. The resulting analog signal is then amplified by a high-speed operational amplifier. In order for the wave to be continuous, the beginning and ending bytes of the wavetable must match. When I initially set up the AWG, I made the following decisions. 1. I set the wavetable length to 256 bytes. 2. One or more wave cycles could be defined in the wavetable. 3. There should be sample points at least at the minimum, maximum, and crossing points for each individual cycle. This is assured if the number of cycles in the wavetable are in order of 2, for instance, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on. I thought this would result in a more symmetric waveform. 4. The state machine clock frequency would be modified as needed to generate the desired wave frequency. It would be derived from the system clock using both integer and fractional divisors. 5. I tried to keep the wave resolution high, resulting in fewer wave cycles per wavetable. The frequency of the generated wave is calculated by multiplying the state machine clock frequency times the number of cycles per wavetable divided by the number of samples per wavetable. The state machine clock is derived by dividing the system clock with integer and fractional divisors. This gives, on average, a wide range of state machine clock frequencies. However, frequency jitter is introduced with the fractional divisor. In this example, when generating a 4 MHz wave, we need a divisor of 1.953, which will produce a shorter state machine clock pulse every 22 pulses. This is most noticeable when observing a square wave, but I also saw it while displaying a sine wave. As stated in the RP2040 datasheet, the effects of the frequency jitter become much less noticeable at higher integer divisors. This suggests that at high frequencies, we only use an integer divisor and no fractional divisor in order to eliminate jitter in the state machine clock. How can we accomplish that? Well, for the waveform to be continuous, the starting point of the wave in the wavetable should match up with the ending point. When the wavetable is small, like 256 bytes, there are only a few sequences of waves that can fit into that space and still meet the requirement that the first and last value match up. However, if we were to expand the wavetable to, say, 4096 bytes, our choice of the number of cycles per wavetable would be dramatically increased. We can turn to the Nyquist sampling theorem to help us out further. In general, it states that to create a sine wave, the wave should have twice as many samples per second as the frequency we want to produce. This means that I don't have to choose a number of cycles in the wavetable that is a power of 2 to create symmetrical waveforms. I can choose any number of cycles per wavetable as long as the first and last values match up. Let's turn to an example to demonstrate what we're talking about. Originally, I used a wavetable buffer of 256 bytes. Assuming symmetrical sampling and keeping the state machine clock as high as possible, 
we get the following jitter-free prime frequencies using 125 megahertz pico 3.91 megahertz 7.81 megahertz 15.63 megahertz and 31.25 megahertz all other frequencies are derived using a fractional divisor to generate a different state machine clock however if we expand the wavetable buffer to 4096 bytes and use sampling theory we can generate hundreds of prime frequencies, including these values that are centered around 4 MHz, 3.937, 3 3.967, 3.998, 4.028, 4.059, and 4.089 MHz. True, they're still discrete frequencies, but there are many more to choose from. Basically, we're trading higher resolution of the waveform for a higher sampling rate. Since we're only using integer divisors, in this case one, the jitter is much more stable. Frequency RMS gives us a quantitative method for measuring the jitter. Here's a comparison between the old method and the new method for a four megahertz sine wave. We can see that the jitter is significantly lower with the new method. Although this seems to smooth out the sine wave, I'm skeptical that it'll work for triangle and square waves. The Nyquist sampling theorem only mentions reproducing sine waves. Let's give it a try. The square wave jitter at 4 MHz is about the same between the old and new method. When we try it on the triangle wave, the new method is a hot mess since the top of the waveform is significantly distorted. Let's look at a comparison of 7 MHz between the old and new methods for sine, square, and triangle waves. The sine wave is more stable with the new method whereas the square and triangle waves are not as good with the new method. Here's also a quick comparison at 3 MHz. The results are similar. So it looks like we can improve sine waves a bit using the new method. This technique works well for higher frequencies, but the choice of prime frequencies is pretty sparse for lower frequencies. In fact, the lowest frequency we can achieve with the new method is 30.5 kHz. Luckily, the method I used in the last video worked very well for lower frequencies. So our final program will incorporate both methods, one for low frequencies and the other for high. Let's touch on the revised program a bit. It's nearly identical to the FAST AWG program in episode 15, except I've increased the wavetable buffer size to 4096 bytes, added a switch for low frequency or high frequency methods. As we discussed, the low frequency method varies the state machine clock frequency as needed to achieve the desired output frequency. This is the same as the FAST AWG program presented in episode 15. I added a switch to allow for very low frequencies to be generated. The high frequency method is to set the state machine clock cycle to the system clock frequency of 125 MHz and dial in the desired frequency by the appropriate selection of the number of wave cycles in the wavetable buffer. For example, the number of cycles in the 4096 long wavetable buffer is calculated by multiplying the desired frequency by the bytes in the wavetable and then by dividing the number by the state machine clock frequency. The length of the wavetable, the number of cycles in the wavetable, and the state machine clock frequency are used to generate the wavetable, which is then output exactly the same as in episode 15. Finally, let's demonstrate the Pico as an AWG for very low frequencies. Here it is generating a sine wave at 10 Hz and at 40 Hz. We don't have a very crisp square wave due to the AC coupling capacitor between the digital to analog converter and the amplifier circuit. That capacitor needs to be higher if we want to generate a better square wave. Thanks for joining me today. We gained a little improvement in the jitter for high frequency sine waves by trading wave resolution 
in favor of sampling frequency. As predicted by the Nyquist sampling theorem, this only works for sine waves and not for triangle or square waves. The Pico will work well as an AWG for frequencies below 1 MHz. We could use it as the basis for an audio synthesizer. That might be a project for another day. In the meantime, I've just scored a couple Raspberry Pi Pico W's months after they were released, so I'll take a look at how I might use them. If you have any suggestions, please let me know. If you like this video or you think someone else might, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. The more likes this video has, the more YouTube will recommend it to others. Also, please leave a comment or suggestion for things to do. I hope to do more of these videos, so please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications of new videos. Let's get together next time for another day in Life with David. See you soon!